There's a lot of like woo woo stuff in our world, but nothing is more woo woo than a seed that can look like a pebble, right? That could sit on a countertop, sit in a refrigerator, sit in um, a pyramid for 1200 years. And then under the right circumstances, this seed will germinate. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. I'm super excited to um, talk with you today because I have just started my sprouting journey and we're sprouting extensively at home um, now and I'm just uh, loving it, but I'm at the beginning of the journey and I'm just learning so much. Um, and I just really want to share this simple but life-changing practice with all of the listeners. Um, and there could be no better person in the world to educate on sprouts uh, with more depth and verb um, than you. Um, and so thank you. And, you know, over the last week, I've had a chance to read your book, which I believe came out in 2020 which is yes. called The Sprout Book, Tap into the Power of the Planet's Most Nutritious Food. And it, just to say that it's illuminating would be an understatement. I've just gotten so much out of it. So thank you for writing that book. Um, and I, I, re, I, I just recommend it to everyone who's interested in this, and there's every reason to be interested. So there's so much I want to cover, um, including what actually makes Sprouts the world's most nutritious food. But I want to just start with some very foundational knowledge for those who are not familiar with sprouting at all. So maybe you could just take a moment and explain to us what is a sprout? So basically all plant life on this planet begins with seeds and seeds are concentrated sources of energy and life force. There's a lot of like woo woo stuff in our world, but nothing okay. is more woo woo than a seed that can look like a pebble, right? That could sit on a countertop, sit in a refrigerator, sit in um, a pyramid for 1200 years. And then under the right circumstances, this seed will germinate, AKA sprout, and turn into life. And so all plants begin with seeds. Seeds, um, when given that environment, usually water and darkness will start to germinate and roots will form, shoots will form, and then they will grow into a progression of plants from a seed to a sprout, to a microgreen, to an herb, to a, a baby, green to a garden vegetable, right? Market stage vegetable. And then if left in the garden long enough, will flower. And then the vegetable will fruit and that fruit will have pods on it. And those pods will have seeds on it. And it's like the circle <laughs> of life. Yes. Yeah. I hadn't quite thought of it in that cyclical way before, but that is an absolutely beautiful way. And as you say, relatively woo woo <laughs> way to think about it. Uh, but it, you know, when we look at natural systems, this is what becomes illuminated time and time again. I mean, you can look at the carbon cycle, um, you can look at the exchange of uh, carbon dioxide for oxygen. Um, over and over, what we see is this sort of crest and trough of the yin yang of the Tao appearing in in natural systems. So, um, so there is some uh, well founded woo woo in it. So, is there is there any difference between like a seedling and a shoot and a sprout? Are these all kind of in interchangeable words? Um, help There's us kind of like navigate the vocabulary a little. I mean, there's, there's a lot of nuance, right? So a shoot is a part of a sprout, not necessarily synonymous. Like a sprout will have a root and a shoot and inside the seed, 
like the seed itself contains uh, an embryo and an endosperm and the testa and right. it's equivalent of like a placenta i mean there's all the which is its nutrition and but as it grows there are distinctions you know in our current vocabulary between like a sprout and a microgreen right those are distinctions mm. Although, just because I love sprouting in jars, I grow microgreens in jars, which is a no-no because usually a microgreen <laughs> is grown in a tray with soil. And one of right. the things about sprouts is the sprout stage that zero to seven days occurs without soil, without sunshine, without fertilizer and if you were to weigh the the sprouts after seven days and remove all the water they're growing 10x their size like the dry weight increases so where's that coming from right that's what i was going to ask you because this is pre-photosynthetic right That's this right. is not there's no chlorophyll or plastids in at this juncture no that process is not being catalyzed so where is it coming from <laughs> i mean it's like what happens is the seed is the store of energy and life force and it is you know the most nutritious food on the planet because it's it's so small and concentrated and you know we're 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 going to take a turn i'm very conscious now cuz i'm fully present with you on this i'm taking a turn hmm. so there's um like i look at sprouts as food originally i looked at them as a garnish but now i look at them as food as vegetables so sprouts are vegetables i also look at sprouts as vitamins and minerals and for your sophisticated hmm you know, um, listeners, not only are they um, vitamins and minerals, they're micronutrients, phytonutrients, polyphenols, bioflavonoids, pro um, prebiotic, probiotics, they're all like in there and they're antioxidants. And what happens is that every benefit of the whole food plant-based diet actually exists within sprouts so you're getting this, like one handful of sprouted garbanzo beans is 20 plus grams of protein, right? And antioxidants and soluble and insoluble fiber. And it's a whole food, like it's a constellation. Um, and, and then the, the last thing, then this is the, the, like the blow your mind thing for me. The plant's mm -hmm. defense mechanisms are medicinal to humans. So what would protect the plant from predators like insects ends up being medicinal properties. So there's, um, you know, precursors to the compound sulforaphane that exist in cruciferous mm -hmm. vegetables. And Dr. Jed Fahey's, you know, devoted 20 years of his life to researching this because it was well known that there were some anti-cancer properties in um, cruciferous vegetables, right? Turns out broccoli had the most of these anti-cancer compounds. And so then it was like, which strain of broccoli? And that was the wrong question. The question turned out to which stage of broccoli? And turned out the seeds oh, yeah. themselves had a finite dose of glucoraphanin and myrosinase in the seed, like microscopic level. But turns out in the seed level, because of the shell, this the, the, the shell, the testa around the seed, there were enzyme inhibitors on the, the shell that made it hard to assimilate and digest. So it turned out like day three, of soaking, germinating the seed, and when it sprouts, made the most access to this glucoraphanin 
And imagine there's like little water balloon, little modules inside. And there was the glucoraphanin, which is one compound. And then there's the morosinase, which is the enzyme, these little water balloon bags. And when you chop it, chew it, crush it, they would mix. And that was the defense mechanism. If an insect bit through um, to ward off the insect, and that ended up being the forming this very fast acting sulforaphane, which if any of your listeners um, go just Google it, there's been more than 2,500 peer reviewed published papers of treating, not curing, but treating cancer patients, autism, Alzheimer's, diabetes. That's like this whole plethora of solutions, you know, that they're derived from these simple things as sprouts. That's just incredible. So there's so much, so many threads to pull out there. So essentially baked into the genetic code of seeds, these tiny little seeds that if anyone's watching on YouTube, um, they're, you know. That's about 50,000 you know, seeds in that bag, by the way. In this bag. So baked into each one of those is the genetic information uh, that can manifest itself without sunlight and without soil. So pre-photosynthetic, <laughs> because within those seeds there is, or within um, the endosperm, I, I assume, there is a certain amount of stored ATP or energy that allows that little tiny seed to sprout and right. and and that we as humans co-evolved with these things such that when we actually consume them it's adaptive for us so they have things like you say sulforaphane which um is uh is anti-carcinogenic or you know icts uh you'll have to pronounce help me pronounce it isothiocyanates yeah, <laughs> i think yeah. they are and glucosinolates yeah. um Right, which are things that I'm just learning about, but they just have these tremendous properties, chemoprotective properties, um, like you say, antioxidant uh, properties, anti-inflammatory properties, essentially, you know, living in, mod in modernity through the toxicity that we have, or just as a product of, of cellular respiration, we create these free radicals uh, in our bodies, in our mitochondria that have these unpaired electrons and that can be very, very um, detrimental to health. They can, you know, create essentially oxidative stress. And through eating sprouts, we can actually mute or neuter that through their antioxidant properties, which is just ridiculously mind blowing. Uh <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's even extensive research on detoxifying benzene from the lungs. Mm you know, through broccoli sprouts and sulforaphane. So, so this is something like what happened is that there were, you know, sprouts have been around, right, since the beginning of time. There have been a lot of, a lot of leadership and a lot of people sprouting and talking about sprouting all through our lives, right? From, you know, I've gone to the end Wigmore Institute. I've gone, um, you know, I, I, I'm friends with Victoris Kovinskis. Like, you know, there was the sprout man out of the Berkshires um, that used to come to Organic Avenue. There were all these people that were sprouting. And I'm like, now I'm a little hippie, right? But I'm more <laughs> of a New York City, like, you know, traditional person. Like I, I wasn't born, like I didn't even know my first vegetarian until I was in my 30s. Right. So this was kind of very abstract. And it was, you know, John Robbins' book, Diet for a New America. When I opened up and I read about the atrocities, you know, to cows, and I closed the book and I put it on the shelf backwards so I wouldn't have to read the spine because it was haunting me what okay, I read. Sure. But I didn't want to throw out the book. And I just did a, you know, a long um, class with I was a, a speaker at the Food Revolution Network, you know, and, and John interviewed yep. me with Oceans. I love those guys. And 
full circle, like full circle. But it was the necessity for me to wanting to be able to maintain my integrity and and standards around food while living in a, a, a tent in a yurt in not only the Mojave Desert, but I was living in a food desert. The nearest Whole Foods was a three hour round trip um, journey. And I was like, there's no way. And to grow a garden in Topanga or in healthy conditions takes weeks or months or years to grow a garden. To grow a garden in the desert, you know, you might as well be a uh, Matt Damon on Mars, right? It's really hard to grow food in the desert. Um, that that's not native permaculture, um, indigenous to, to the land. And that's where when I'm soaking in my hot springs, like looking at the Milky Way, seeing the twinkling of the stars and being hungry, like I was hungry. I'm looking at the stars. There was nothing to do. And then I got like the download. It was like, boom. The stars were twinkling and I was seeing sprouts and my mouth was, I was a bit very Pavlovian reaction. And I was like, Oh, really? You know, and I asked the question. I really didn't know the answer. I said, is it possible to live on sprouts? Like, could you get mm. all of your nutrition, the bulk of nu your nutrition, some of your nutrition from sprouts? And although I'd been eating sprouts for 25 years, I'd get sunflower sprouts at the Union Square Farmer's Market. I was eating mung bean sprouts as part of, you know, uh, Asian cuisine in various levels. Um, I had alfalfa sprouts on all my hippie, trippy salads. So I knew about sprouts and I ate sprouts and I felt like sprouts were like, my my people, I could eat the sprouts. I was down with sprouts. But here, the <laughs> yeah. next month became my deep dive into sprouts as ne necessity because I'm living on magic. I was living on magical land, right? A vortex with hot springs, sunrises, fresh water, geothermal activity, you know, under the land, like I felt right and I figured out how to desalinate water, but I didn't have a source of food. And then sprouts came to me as like woof. And then, you know, when I, when I, you know, I, I'd, I'd known Marianne Williamson for years. Um, Marianne um, invited me onto her podcast to talk about food justice and food equality. And that was this whole other area of thinking about how sprouts were, were literally like food equality, food justice for all. Yes. <laughs> okay. I want to go there because th the socioeconomic attributes of sprouts is not something that a lot of people are talking about, but I, I want to go there. But before we do, I want to close the loop on some of the nutritional aspects, because I, I think it's so important to underscore the multidimensionality of sprouts. So we talked about sulforaphane and, IC, and ITCs, and then you mentioned fiber, protein, low glycemic load, low calorie, whole food, all of these properties, right? Yes. And then we didn't even really talk about all of the vitamins. So maybe just spend a couple minutes just give it, giving us kind of the global view on kind of the multidimensionality of the nutrition that we're talking about here in, in sprouts. And, so, and, and obviously it's going to depend on which sprout. But yeah. Right. Right. Well, just think about this. I would, you know, venture to say I'm not a gambling man, right? But I would venture to say that most people listening to this have eaten lentils, right? Lentils are the staple of a staple of a plant-based diet around the world. Turns out 
that when you soak and sprout lentils, you double the antioxidant levels, you triple the vitamin C, and you quadruple the soluble and insoluble fiber. So here we are taking something that is already well known, nutritious, and there's all this other woo woo stuff in those lentils when they're sprouting that's providing this life force that keeps them going because when you cook them, like you're still getting nutrients, you're still getting fiber, you're still getting antioxidants, but they're no longer growing. So there was something on a psychic level of consuming living food, enzymatically rich food that that the, the science hasn't even begun to go there. Like our nutrition labels, like they're in the most provincial Flintstone level, you know, of, of yeah. communication. But I think let's just take a, take a moment to think about those sprouted lentils. Just think about that. And every color of the lentil, whether it's green or red or orange, that color is representing different antioxidants. So the orange is the mm. beta carotene, the green is the chlorophyll, the, the dark purple blue is the anthocyanidins. Like this is a world that has been largely ignored because we live in a convenience culture where we can go into a supermarket that can have tens of thousands of SKUs that have additives and preservatives and packaging and convenience all over them. And, you know, that like, and that's the world we live in. So sprouts were yeah. overlooked because you had to have some skin in the game. You had to put some effort. You had to add some water. You had to rinse them. You know, you had to, you know, wash the seeds. And so no one wanted to do that. Except now, yeah. when everyone wants to do that. Except, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, if you look at big food, what they're good at is processing for preservation, for shelf life. So, you know, they're irradiating actually often seeds um, yeah. so that they actually don't sprout <laughs> right? Um, because what they're trying to do is actually maintain um, shelf life in a package. But what do you, but what happens when you do that? Well, you're sacrificing um, you know, all of the, the micro and macronutrients that we're, we're talking about. So, you know, a lot of people associate um, sprouts with like broccoli sprouts, became quite famous, um, alfalfa sprouts, obviously. But what can be sprouted? Well, what's the kind of multitude of seeds or legumes or even nuts that, yeah. that can be sprouted so people can get a, get a sense of the broad spectrum? Well, it, it's interesting. I would say all plants have to sprout in order to advance, <laughs> right? There That's are yeah. some some beans, some legumes like kidney beans have high concentrations of trypsins and lectins, which could have a um, negative effect if they are not cooked. But I would sprout the, the kidney beans before um, I would cook them to unleash some of the growth levels. And now you're going to see much more sprouted items. But you know, one of the things, you know, that you can get from sprouts, which is not very well known, is you can get your omega-3 medium chain fatty acids, right, from flax seeds and chia seeds. But when you sprout them, they become very bioavailable. They're very rich in ALA. Uh, that's why if you've seen any of my yes. videos, I normally eat seaweed, you know, whether it's kombu or nori, because by eating the seaweed, with the chia and flax, I'm getting the ALA, EPA, and DHA, 
and I'm getting it without mercury, without, you know, um, bad cholesterol or concentrated fats, like you're getting these medium chain fatty acids in a very bioavailable, rich way. So if you were to say, what can you get out of sprouts? The only thing that you're not getting out of sprouts in the whole vitamin spectrum is vitamin B12. Like you're not getting vitamin B12 in sprouts right. at this time. They're, they're not there. Now, right. I so think, you just supplement with, with B complex or B12, yeah, right? You, you B complex is sublingual, you know, very, but everything right. else, like every single amino acid to form every protein is in every sprout. I'm going to say that again, just because mm-hmm. it, it's, and I'll say it slower. Every amino acid to form every complete protein is in sprouts. Some have more of others, but that's where the variety fills in the constellation and you can get all of the protein you need from sprouts. Right. So I want to underscore that point. And I think it's a very important one to make because people still ask that question when someone becomes vegan or vegetarian. Well, where do you get your protein? That question is still being asked. And yes, we have to exogenously get our essential amino acids of which there are eight or nine. Um, So we need to eat those through our diet. And yes, they are bioavailable in meat products, but they are also bioavailable in plants. You can get all of those nine essential amino acids and your body miraculously makes the other 12 endogenously to then create all the proteins that your body needs, the enzymes, the hemoglobin, the the hormones, the muscles, everything your body needs from a protein perspective can be made through eating sprouts and plants. Is that right? (laughs) That, that, that is, I mean, I am, you know, proudly going to be 56 years old in two weeks. I've eaten exclusively, um, whole food plant-based, mostly raw for 23 years, over 23 years. And I have never met, I mean, I'm sure they exist, but I've never met anyone that was protein deficient. I met a lot of people that were constipated, right? I met a lot of people that were fiber deficient. I've met a lot of people with, you know, all sorts of diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease. But I think when people ask me the question, where do I get my protein? I ask them, where did you get that question? Like, I, did you study nutrition? Like, like, where did you get that question? Because I think that you're only asking that question because you've been programmed to ask that question. And no matter what I tell you, you've been programmed to say something else. So if we should talk about something else, unless you earnestly want <laughs> to be non-biased, open-minded, and see what it's like to, you know, live like a healthy um, herbivore in part. But I'll tell you this, Jeff, when I was running Organic Avenue, I was much more dogmatic and judging. And after a few Vipassana courses and some humbling events, (laughs) I'm now saying, people, do whatever you want. Like, I don't want to tell you what to do. I want to share my experiences and my knowledge and my basic thing is not like become a sproutarian and eat sprouts all the time as your only food source. What I want to say is you can do that, but add some sprouts to your meals, to your snacks, to your smoothies, to your juices, and get take advantage of this gift that nature has provided um, for everyone. and. For, you know, we won't go into the full food equality, food justice, but for for this case, it's just affordable. A handful of seeds are pennies a serving. Well, let's get into that because I think this is huge. This is a huge part of it because so often 
the wellness world has been cubbyholed uh, for the affluent. Um, and, you know, you have uh, whatever spa getaways at, for thousands of dollars a day, et cetera. But Sprouts provides a whole different story uh, uh, around the, the socioeconomic picture. So we often hear about food deserts. You live in a literal desert, but the food deserts are places that can be rural or can be urban, but essentially areas um, that only have accessibility to to processed foods. Correct. And um, fast food, so, processed food. Exactly. So maybe you could spend a few minutes kind of unpacking the how cheap and available sprouts are to everyone how democratizing they are to for health yeah in bulk you could buy a pound of organic sproutable lentils for under three dollars and that will turn into one pound will turn into 10 pounds of nourishment like just just think about the the the, yeah. the metrics or 10 cups you know one cup equals 10 cups so so the idea that that food being healthy being plant based is only you know part of you know societal culture of convenience and of profit and you know one of the things about sprouts is you know, it's it's almost similar to IKEA, right? If you want to buy custom made, high quality furniture, it's going to take you know weeks or months and cost a fortune. If you want to get, you know, a Swedish design, Swedish engineering, pick it up, put it together yourself, get some skin in the game, break a sweat, you can get really good stuff, and. What I found, you know, interesting, you know, is some of the IKEA stuff is actually better engineered than some of the custom stuff because they've applied it. And when when it comes to um, food, you know, I lived always, you know, next to, you know, gourmet um, restaurants, gourmet vegan foods, Whole Foods, Air One, Lifetime, and that's what I thought was the, cre the, the, the cream of the crop. That was the, the best. When I realized the, the food chain, that produce grown in the field, then goes to a warehouse, then goes to the, the supermarket, and then goes out on the shelf, it could be a week, two weeks, three weeks old. You know? And the idea that I could have a fresh harvest that my food was fresh. It wasn't coming from the field. It was there fresh that I could get a fresh harvest every day, every meal. Like I stopped buying vegetables. Like I started to grow my own vegetables. And the, the, the thing is, I'm going to start doing this. And when we do our master class, we'll go into the economics of the meals. So the things that I buy, like I buy avocados. Right. And they're anywhere from a dollar right. to two dollars each. Um, sometimes I make my own fresh tahini, which I really love. It's just sesame seeds. Right. And so I like fresh tahini. Um, sometimes I buy it in bulk and it's really inexpensive in an eight pound, you know, tub of organic tahini. And I buy my seaweeds. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, um, it turns out the things that I like, some of the most expensive things, and some are really inexpensive. I love making my own sauerkraut, right? And, you know, turns out cabbage is really inexpensive, right? So, yeah. So, I like, I'm a happy camper. Yeah. Well, no, I think our course needs to be sprouts and krauts because we, um, yeah, we, uh, we ferment all here as well. And we have a big, uh, right next to our sprouting kind of setup, we have our big, um, our, our sauerkraut brew um, happening. And 
Uh, I know, so we'll get into some of the recipes maybe towards the end, but I know that you have some great combos there. But just to to kind of finish the loop back up on the, the socioeconomic side, and, and this really came from reading your book. I mean, this was a total eye-opener for me because I had started sprouting and, you know, Skylar, my wife, really led the charge on it. And, I you know, I was starting to experiment with different ways to eat it. And then I started to learn about some of the nutritional aspects of it, but I hadn't really thought through the, these points, which is they're always in season. They yeah. address this food desert issue. They're space efficient. They're water efficient. They don't need soil or sunlight. They're, I think you know, I read in the book, they're under $2 per pound. They're always local and fresh. There's no carbon footprint. There's no picking or packing. I mean, you could just go on. Yeah, no packaging. The, the no packaging, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I I think, and just just to be accurate, they're as low as two dollars a pound. But like broccoli mm -hmm. seeds, which like a bag, you know, can be twenty dollars or twenty five dollars a pound. But you only use two tablespoons at a time, you know, uh, of them. Right. So. It, and two tablespoons can equal six cups of broccoli sprouts. So, yeah. I think I think there's so much here, Jeff. Where where I'm going to let you drive, so I stay on point. Well, let's get into a little bit of the quote unquote sausage making, if you don't mind, um, because of what I really I think people are now getting their arms around grokking all of the benefits from it but i want to get people kind of going on their journey and of course uh they should buy your book um because there's a or get it on audible that's the way i enjoyed it because i love hearing your voice um and i also then downloaded the pdf that's connected to that which has a tremendous amount of information you call it your captain's log which i think is perfect um so i want to just answer some of the basic questions that I know come up around sprouting and then how one actually gets out of the gates and just starts their first sprouting escapade. So first of all, I know some folks get worried about safety because from time to time you hear about outbreaks of foodborne illness, salmonella, E. coli associated with sprouts, particularly from the grocery store anyways. Is it safe to sprout? Can you just address that core question? Yeah. So I would say, and by the way, I have a data scientist on our team, you know, that studies this. And I've got a nutritional biochemist from Johns Hopkins University that studies this. And basically, we analyzed um, 25 years of um, FDA history of foodborne illness, outbreaks, hospitalizations and deaths. And it turns out eating anything could be at risk. There's no greater risk from eating sprouts. If we, if we dive deeper into any of the instances around sprouts, um, they were all predominantly um, food service related, fast food service related, non-organic, um, commercially, um, made without standards, without proper sanitation, and with cross-contamination um, with animal products. So the, the, the idea of mixing raw sprouts, you know, and raw chicken is like um, not safe, okay? Um, yeah. Sprouting at home, there's virtually been no reported cases that I know of um, outbreaks, hospitalizations, or deaths from homegrown sprouting. As a level of, of deep concern, right? I have a pregnant wife, right? So that's an issue. My pregnant wife eats sprouts every day. Okay. So I'm not saying you do that, but I'm saying, you know, we do it, right? Um, Dr. Will Bolshevitz, who wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Fiber Fuel. His wife yep. um, ate broccoli sprouts through her entire pregnancy, and their two-year-old kid 
one of the first solid foods that the baby ate was broccoli sprouts because he developed in utero flavor development, which is a thing. So um, what I recommend is that to treat the seeds, if you have any concern whatsoever, you can do surface level sanitation of the seeds, which um, you can buy normal um, clinical grade hydrogen peroxide is 3%. That's what they sell in you know Walgreens. In health food stores and online, you can get 12% food grade hydrogen peroxide. You don't need a lot of it. If you were to soak the seeds for 15 minutes in the food grade 12% hydrogen peroxide, you will reduce surface level bacteria. And um, I don't know where you stand. To me, I'm not all against um, uh, bad ba bacteria. Like I think we are microbes. But nonetheless, if you're concerned by soaking the, the seeds in the food grade hydrogen peroxide, you reduce the mold and um, bacteria to virtually zero levels. And I'm validating this, you know, at the University of California at Santa Cruz in their botanical lab, we're doing the, the, the work. But if you were to take your seeds and rinse them, soak them in the food grade hydrogen peroxide, then rinse them in the water, you are starting off with probably the safest um, starter right. that you could have. Then all of your equipment, your jars, your screens, everything should be properly washed with hot water and soap, right? So you're starting with a clean base. And then the end of your sprouting journey, if you have any concern about bacteria, you can then rinse the seeds and soak the seeds, rinse the seeds in um, GAA, glacial acidic acid, AKA white vinegar. So you soak hmm. them in vinegar, rinse them in vinegar, and then rinse off the extra vinegar, put them in the salad spinner, and you are starting off with, so you're going to consume something that, and, and you know, there's different hurdles you could do. If you were to start off with like what I recommend, buying organic seeds, that have been already tested for pathogens that are tested for high germination rate. And then you soak them in the peroxide. You rinse your twice a day. You follow the protocol in the book and you have it. You're probably consuming in the top one tenth of 1% of safe food on the planet. Great. Um, well, that brings up another question. So let's say I want to get some seeds or legumes or something to sprout um and we do we addressed this briefly before but you can you know you can do chickpeas lentils mung beans broccoli radish azuki clover on and on um does one can one just walk into the grocery store and pick up a bag of lentils or do you get specialized sprouting seeds from a particular distributor you know it's a great question. It depends on where you live in the world. Like I'm advising, you know, people in East Africa that don't have access to health food stores. They barely have access to, you know, any of the things. So they're starting with the best case they can and they don't have the food grade hydrogen peroxide. And so they have bleach. So it turns out Hypochloric acid, hypochlorous acid, um, bleach is a very effective sanitizing agent and can easily be rinsed off and turns into salt and saline. There's a fine line between a salt water pool and a chlorine pool, um, the salt. Um, and you can wash off the seeds in there. If you live, and probably if you're listening to this particular you know, podcast, 
Um, you have access to organic sprouting seeds. So I would buy those because there's a higher degree of, of testing and germination that goes into those. So it's more mm -hmm. of like the first crop. It's like top shelf versus bottom shelf, because if you're cooking them, you know, it really doesn't matter whether they're in the bottom shelf of the bulk bin in there. But if you're sprouting them and you're going right. to eat them raw and you're going to feed them to your family, invest a few cents more to get better quality seeds. Right. So I, um, I have some seeds here. So I've got some um, broccoli seeds and then I've got a, uh, well, I've got, these are kind of like some, you know, mixed legumes. Mixed protein. So I, I, we, yeah, exactly. So these are from Sprout People. That just happens to be the the uh, the outlet that that we have started buying from. I, I don't know if you have a particular preferred um, outlet that you buy from, or, or perhaps you just have your yeah. own at this juncture. Well, I recommend. I think Sprout People, Sprout Man, Sprout House, True Leaf Market. You know that those are a bunch of high quality vendors you know, that are selling seeds, you know, with a, with a standard of, of orientated towards sprouts, towards sprouting, mm -hmm. right. Versus right. just, you know, like now what's happened, you know, since my, my book came out, um, the, the, like sprouting is just everywhere. I mean, like there, there used to be almost no sprouting equipment on Amazon. Now there's thousands of sprouting options, jars, trays, lids, et cetera, which, which I love. Like, I think it's incredible, yeah. but, um, well, you, I think you, you've sprouted it. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is, you know, you know, in many ways, I think you, you've helped to, to create this movement, you know, this revolution in sprouting. I mean, for me, I'll tell you. Um, as we can, it's probably a good time. Let's say you go to Sprout People or one of these other vendors and you get your seeds and you're ready to go. Um, you know, it's probably a good time to talk about what are the tools that are required, um, minimal though they may be. And, you know, you can do it probably uh, just really with probably what you already have around the house. Like I've invested a tiny bit and these are just um, courtesy of the people that are actually watching this on video but I'll try to describe it on audio a little bit. So I have this little contraption, which you've seen, yep. which you see here, which is just basically two uh, wide mouth um, quarter gallon mason jars. And then kind of on the top of them, they have this kind of a lattice screen, if you will. Um, and they sit in this carriage that keeps them on an angle uh, draining. And, uh, and that was, and that's it, you know, that's what I have. We've got a couple of these, um, and we invested, you know, <laughs> about 50 bucks <laughs> yeah, um, to keep ourselves deep, deep in sprout. So I wonder what are your, the preferred tools, um, for sprouting? Well, I wrote a chapter in my book called junkyard dog, right? Where basically <laughs> it's yeah. specifically around taking things that are in the house, um, I would say you can use the wide mouth ball mason jar, or you can use the um, any like um, sauce jar or um, is really perfect. I buy bulk um, organic cheesecloth, the 50 um, mm -hmm. count thread mesh weave. And, you know, I, I bought, 150 rubber bands on Amazon for $2.29 <laughs> yesterday. So like I use rubber bands, cheesecloth, and any jars. Um, I, mm -hmm. we, we at our wedding, we had 100 people. You know, I made sprouts using these half gallon jars um, that come with the little mesh screen on those. And um, because sprouting is an important part, I've hijacked my dish tray so the our dish rack has sure. you know holds seven of these large jars on there 
And basically, since we're in the desert, you know, normally anywhere else in the world, you turn your dishes upside down to let them dry out. Here, we just leave them on the counter and they just dry instantly. So I, the dish rack is perfect for sprouting. So really what mm. you need is you need seeds. And we discussed preferably organic seeds, sprouting seeds. You need a jar or a vessel. I prefer one that you could get your hand in, um, but you could use a smaller one. Um, you can They sell these lids for a couple dollars each or five dollars each you know, on Amazon that act as a screen. Some are metal, some are plastic, some are cheesecloth. You know, they all, they have their pros and cons. Um, and then they make, you have a cute little kit with two jars and the, you know, the looks like an iPad stand to hold them in the right orientation and then a drip tray, right? And that's the yeah. basic part. I did a deep dive with, um, with Dr. Will Bolshevitz on how to create DAO from sprouting um, P sprouts in the dark because the absence of the light stresses the plants and creates more of the histamine um, reactor. So the, the DAO, yeah. just mind boggling stuff with this. Um, yeah. So yeah. we went deep on that. So you know, I, I have a technique of wrapping the, 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 the jars in aluminum foil as a opaque sleeve to block the light, to create the stress huh. and noticeable difference, you know, in um, allergies and in pollen. So that's where, when I go back to Sprouts as medicine, we're just scratching the surface. And I did a, um, I've done several um, interviews with um, Robbie Barbero and Cyrus from Mastering Diabetes. And turns out the number one food for recommend for balancing and regulating insulin levels is are sprouts, right? High fiber, yeah. low calories, low fat. Yeah. Well, it makes it ton of sense because they're low glycemic so they're not going to spike your glucose levels so they're not going to stress your pancreas to create excessive insulin and they're high in fiber so they're essentially high in soluble and insoluble fiber but the soluble fiber is essentially feeding your gut microbiome which is then making these short chain fatty acids like butyrate which upregulate insulin sensitivity and protect the integrity of the epithelial wall so you're 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 not getting leaky gut, et cetera. So these are just, uh, again, this is, this is where it's at, man. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so, I'm so yeah. glad we arrived so, at this, Jeff. It's, it's been a long time coming. I know. Well, now it, in combination with all this other information that I've learned about basic physiology and gastroenterology from folks like Will Bolsowitz and, um, that you're talking with and, uh, and so many other functional integrated medicine doctors, you know, once you start to understand the mechanisms of, of your physiology, then you can start to uh, understand how food and nutrients interacts with that. And then you come across sprouts and you're like, whoa, it's checking all these boxes. And you're just like, holy moly, this is it. Um, so, uh, I actually, I wanted to ask you one question about, um, before we get into actually the making, because now we've got the seeds and we've got the tools, but do you ever do, um, and this is for bakers, any bakers out there, do you ever do, uh, like sprouted grain flowers, essentially sprouted grains that then you mill? Is that something that well, you've experimented with? Uh, check out Ed's bread on instagram okay you know he's got yeah. like eighty thousand followers and their vegan bakery near whistler in canada um they bought my book they actually sell my book the sprout book in their bake shop okay like they're all Love in it. Uh, on on sprouting i don't bake and i don't cook any food so for me like i'm doing but by okay. sprouting 
the seeds and germinating, like the combination of sourdough, sprouting, fermentation. It's just this incredible, you know, went, went from being like unhealthy to really healthy. And so I, I'm open now, like now that, you know, I'm, I'm away from everything else and I'm more regulating, I'm open to, you know, eating like sprouted grain. Like you can buy in the frozen section, the Ezekiel bread of all sprouted in the frozen yeah. section. And I've never really eaten that. It just didn't seem appealing to me. But now like I'm curious, you know, to, to eat that. Yeah. My wife also started making um, like sprouted seed crackers. Oh yeah. Um, Those are, are the best. Amazing. Those unbelievable. Yeah. Like the texture, the consistency, so um, you know, the flax, the chia, the sun-dried tomato. Basically, you can make them with all the things that you already love, and they're just crunchy right. and delicious, like incredible. Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Let's get into it a little bit. So now we've got our seeds, and we got our jars, and we can start really simple. I mean, however you want to frame it, either with you know some broccoli seeds or alfalfa or a mix. Um, but where do we where do we go from here? Okay, so step one, right? You get all your equipment, right? Step two, when you're ready to sprout, you just want to look at your calendar and understand like where are you going to be when these sprouts are ready? Because you don't want to be out out to lunch, off the grid, etc. So um, once you know you're going to be there, you can handle them. Sprouts aren't quite like having a baby. But you have to pay attention to them and nurture them, you know, two minutes a day, right? In morning and afternoon. So step one, when you're making the sprouts is soak the seeds in your food grade hydrogen peroxide for 15 minutes, 12% food grade hydrogen peroxide for 15 minutes. Then rinse off the hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide will actually stimulate the germination already. Like the, the, this will remove some of the enzyme inhibitors and initiate the germination. Then you want to soak the broccoli seeds in water. So put, put the seeds in, add the water, let them soak for a, between five and eight hours. So if you're sprouting in the day and you're at five hours, that should be good. If you're sprouting overnight, eight hours, you know, if you go to 12 hours, they'll be okay. There's, Sprouts are very tolerant within those frameworks. Then after you soak them the first time, you're adding the screen or the, the lid or the cheesecloth to it. You want to shake off and strain any of the extra water. You then want to fill it up again with fresh water, swirl it around, and basically you want to remove the exudates, the biofilm, any bacteria that's building up, and you're basically giving the the sprouts sprouting seeds a little shower, and then you oh. want to strain off, shake off the extra water, and then find an inverted position between 30 degrees and 45 degrees, so that the excess water will strain out of the jar. And I say 30 to 45 degrees. If you've got a straight edge jar, 30 degrees is fine. If you've got a narrow mason jar that has a shoulder on it, you don't want to accumulate a pocket of water inside. So you want to be right. at an angle that causes complete excavation of the excess water. Got it. Right. That makes sense. So if I'm getting the message, excess moisture is a foe in this particular process. Yeah, it's real it's in, it's so interesting cuz you need the water, right? You need the water and right. the absence of the water will will cause the sprouts to get these root hairs that fuzz because they're dry and they want more. But too much water right. is no good. Yeah. It's interesting. It's kind of like the body. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, your, your cells don't want to be overhydrated and they don't want to be underhydrated. So yeah, it's all about homeostasis, right? So you want to keep them going yes. and there's different levels. If someone's in a very arid environment like I am, I might add, I might rinse them for a third time a day. If someone's in a hot, humid environment like Florida, I might rinse them with cold water, right? Just to, you know, refresh them, you know? Right. So there's all these like nuances, which is why I wrote the book. Um, but then let's finish the cycle. So you rinse these, go through the process of soaking, then rinsing, then letting them sit, then um, rinsing them again with fresh water, letting them rinse. You do that twice a day, depending on the varietal, like lentils and garbanzo beans and soy, um, soybeans, you could do those and start eating them after 24 hours. Right. If you're doing mm. garden variety vegetables or you want the lentils to shift from a lentil into a vegetable, you do the process five days to seven days. Yeah. And yeah, so then, yeah, it varies. And in your book, in the PDF, you have, uh, you kind of break it down there. 142 in terms of what are the pages in the PDF. <laughs> <laughs> I know I couldn't get through it. I kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Um, but yeah, no, I'm going to, I have my, my jar here. I'm going to take the top off just for a second and then uh, hold up one of these lentils. Oops. Sorry. This is not great for audio, but uh, so yeah. So then, you know, you get a little. Look at that. Um, oh my God. My mouth is watering. Up. Yeah, you <laughs> see the enzymes in your mouth are already going. That looks like a mung bean, so this actually, is, this, not being... Uh, that, that is a mung bean. No, you're, okay. you're right. You're, yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. this is a lentil. Anyways, um, so... Uh, um, and then, you know, what I do is I stagger a little bit. So I'll have, you know, these... You could probably tell by just looking at it, but these are a couple days in, and then yeah. I have one that just started. Um, and uh, and so then you kind of have a flow going. Absolutely. Okay, so we've we've soaked, we've drained and rinsed for a, a couple of days, depending on on what we're sprouting. Uh, we've repeated that process, and then we get to harvest, right? Yeah. So take us. And then the harvest that. stage is um, you you pour in white vinegar and let the vinegar sit. Okay you know, for five to 15 minutes. Then you strain off the vinegar. You rinse them with water two or three times to get off any, you know, of the of vinegar smell. You'll get used to it quickly. Um, and then use a salad spinner, pour it all mm -hmm. into the salad spinner, and you spin off using the centrifugal force, the extra water, and then you eat. And if you if you want to store them, you could store them in drain off the water out of the sal the sh the salad spinner, and then you could store them in there. You 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 don't want to store them in an airtight container. Um, you want to have a crack of of air inside. Huh. Interesting. Okay, that's a good question then. So like I have this glass Pyrex here. Yes. Um. We put like uh, just um, a paper towel in the bottom of it to soak up any additional moisture. Yeah. Um, it actually kind of just randomly has a crack in the top here. Yeah, but that's good. Normally, we do, what I want, yeah, <laughs> but normally we, I would want to have some sort of aeration. Is that yeah, what you're saying? The, the, pro, the, the sprouts are alive, so they are respiring. Mm -hmm. So they are consuming CO2 and releasing oxygen. And so uh, if you ever look at the produce that they sell in the supermarket, they never put them in airtight greens because then they'll become mealy. So they need air. Mm. Got it. Cool. And, uh, and probably making the air in your house. Good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know you, um, did, I know you, you went up and, and did your, your podcast with, with uh, Paul Hawken. I don't know if you're, how much, um, a carbon you're sequestering with sprouts, 
<laughs> but but yeah, right. you're you're making a little contribution by <laughs> you're, you're by lowering your carbon footprint by not shipping around heavy stuff all over the other place. Well, that's for sure. So so we went through the process. Where is the best place to actually execute this process within your home? Are you really looking for darkness or is your kitchen counter okay if it's not in direct sunlight or I, I think give us some tips there as for a convenience perspective as close to the the kitchen sink as possible and if you've got filtered water we didn't talk about water i always recommend using the best water you can if you live in you know in flint michigan you know or ferguson you may want to buy invest a dollar in to get distilled water or spring water. You want to use the best water you can. But I wouldn't and not I wouldn't so then your not, story. Wait one second. I wouldn't not sprout if I didn't have good water. I would, you know, like I would trust that the sprouts would do okay. But um if you have a choice, use the best water you can. Got it. And I after harvesting, I am storing in the refrigerator. Um, right. And yes. and how long more or less will uh will these sprouts last I would say or does maximum, it depend on the varietal? They'll probably stand stay for longer than this, but I would consume them within three days. Got it. So you're yeah. Okay. And yeah, I, I've had them in there for a week before and they still feel and taste fresh, but that's maybe on the outside. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you think about if they were commercially grown, right, they would have a shelf life that would be a week anyway, considering the supply chain. But I encourage people to eat, eat your sprouts, grow new ones. Yeah. And you mix them, right? When you eat them, You're, you find all sorts of different combinations. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, if you, if, if now what we know about biodiversity of the gut. I like to eat as many different mm. varieties as you were describing, the, the alfalfa, the azuki, the arugula, the radish, clover, broccoli, chia, all sorts of peas, lentils, hemp. Like I love it all. Right. Yeah. But some I mean, things I, are one hard. One thing I know that- Some things like yeah. fenugreek, like it's hard to eat fenugreek sprouts, right? You really got to bury them into something else. Yeah, or like I had onion sprouts and they were so potent that I couldn't actually finish all of them because they had so much spice. So I was just kind of sprinkling them on things because too much was Yeah. You could cut them too with much. Yeah. You could cut them with tahini, you know, or avocado, mm -hmm. you know. Th those are very effective um balancing for the spiciness. Right. So let's talk about some of the recipes that you have in your book. So, um, and the one that I'm grooving on is one with, it's sort of a tahini base. Actually, I don't even know if this is in the book because I think I watched you do this on Instagram, but it was a tahini base. And then I'm adding a whole bunch of different varietals of sprouts on top of that. And then chopped avocado on there. Um, and, uh, and then salt and pepper and lemon. And I think, you know, that's it. And I'm kind of like stirring that almost into a mash. And yeah. I, I just can eat it just like that. But sometimes I put that on a seed cracker and get out of town. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's it, man. That's the stuff. It, it's, you know, the, the book, the Sprout Book has 40 recipes in it from soups and smoothies and snacks and even desserts with it. Um, what, what I found, you know, from the, the, the global sprouting community is that people just add them to everything and anything that they like. And yeah. what I, what, what's probably been the biggest phenom is straight sprout salads, like re replacing greens with sprouts, yeah. like garden variety, um, sprouts, um, garden mixture, the radish, clover, broccoli, you know, instead of the mixed greens is just a game changer. And snacking, like I, I, it's not in the book, but I put it up on Instagram. I made not corn. Like, you know, when we were watching a movie on Netflix, like I like to eat and watch, 
I just took two day old sprouted garbanzo beans and I put them into nutritional yeast with like a hint of Himalayan salt. Mm. And it was like better, so far better than any popcorn or processed snack you can have. And so now I'm thinking about the, the parts like, I used to add when I was under the protein like spell, I used to add protein powders, you know, to a smoothie. And now I just throw in a handful of like lentil sprouts or garbanzo bean sprouts or soybean sprouts, you know, to a smoothie. And basically I want to eat sprouts as often as I can. Like that's my my goal. Right. And and one thing that I think it's important for people to grok, which we haven't quite yet touched on, is the nutritional concentration. So can you just spend maybe a couple minutes talking about um, the concentration of nutrients in sprouts, in like, for example, broccoli sprouts versus a head of broccoli? Yeah. So if you think about the broccoli sprout, it it has everything that the mature broccoli has in it, except it has less water and less insoluble fiber roughage. So what happens is you're just getting this enormous concentration of these finite micronutrients, phytonutrients, ICTs that they're in there. And as the vegetable gets bigger, as the broccoli gets bigger, those finite compounds um, do not scale. So there's a fixed amount of glucoraphanin mm. and myrosinase in there. So that's why they say the sprouts can have 50 to 100 times the nutrition than the mature um, product because these phytonutrients do not scale. They're dosed out. So the younger and tender um, they are, the more concentration you're getting, which is, you know, one of the things for the weight loss is that when the brain is getting nourished, it says enough. When it's getting empty calories laden with extra salt, oil, fat, sugars, it's saying, where are the nutrients? And people are overeating because it doesn't matter how much you're eating. Those those um, food engineering are designed to make you eat more and, and you won't get full. And that's why people will still finish that extra slice of pizza, that extra scoop. Like I've watched people eat, you know, three more scoops of, you know, the Ben and Jerry's ice cream when they are full, like they, they, they're full and they're still eating it, right? I can well, say, do this yeah, experiment. I mean. <laughs> you cannot, no, I don't know anyone who overeats raw sprouts. I don't know anybody. Right? Because that, that's right. Well, this is like a, yeah, this case where culture has outpaced evolution in, in so many ways because you know, we have these neuropods in our gut, which are these neurons that sense sugar and like this bliss point, for example, and sends a, a signal up axons through the vagus nerve to our brain to keep eating because in times of scarcity, when we evolved, you know, 30, 40,000 years ago, we wanted to eat all the figs off the fig tree because we wanted to store fat for winter because, or for the next meal, because there was a notion that, that there was scarcity, but now there's no scarcity, but we still have the same evolution because evolution is slow. <laughs> so we gorge on any of these combinations of salt, um, and sugar and fat because they, you know, they're so tantalizing and delectable. And as you say, then we eat a whole pint of, of, uh, you know, peanut butter, pretzel, caramel, you know, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Right. <laughs> and it's so. just, it's just contributing. And that's one of the things that I could say from my own experience, like my eating sprouts, my sharing sprouts, um, like I just feel phenomenal. And that's the true judge. Like, if I ate sprouts and I didn't feel good, like I would be reevaluating it. 
The fact that I can eat the sprouts, feel good, have the energy level, like that's what makes it, you know, like the jackpot to me. Totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, I've, you know, like I said, I'm new to sprouting, but I've started combining it with my 16-8 kind of time-restricted eating protocol. So I, I, you know, do that intermittent fasting thing. Yeah. Pretty much every day. We have so much and in then common. I'll break, yeah. I do the same and thing. I break I'm like the fat. Window. Yeah. So I'll try to consolidate all of my eating, you know, between eleven thirty AM and seven thirty PM, more or less. Um, and I'm not like neurotically fundamentalist about it. You know, I'll go out to eat with friends from time to time and it's okay. But but uh I'll often break my fast with some sprout inclusion because for a whole bunch of reasons, but primarily because of the fiber, because I, whatever I'm eating with it, but I'm also, I'm generally eating something like with high quality fats or high quality protein um, and, and not something with a big glycemic load, but the protein is also going to slow down the absorption of glucose or carbohydrates into my bloodstream. So I'm not going to spike my glucose levels coming out of a fast. And, you know, there's so much good stuff to make with these things that I never get bored. And like you say, I feel great. And that's the ultimate litmus test, right? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, Jeff, this has been so much fun. I, I, I yeah, really love it over the, over the moon. Um, so yeah, it was thank you so, so much. much fun to connect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for providing the, the spark for being the torchbearer for, uh, for this, um, evolution. And I do really think, um, aside from all of kind of the personal health components to it that I get excited about, I think there's a real societal purpose here. Um, and, and I think the more that we can bring this simple and easy and cheap and ecological and hyper satisfying <laughs> practice to people um, in food deserts, in urban areas where there's only 7 Elevens and convenience stores and McDonald's, man, this could make such a big difference. Uh, across you know, healthcare and chronic disease and personal happiness. So, and I'm just, I'm grateful for the work you're doing. Hey, I'm glad you enjoyed this video. We have conversations with today's top thought leaders every single week. So make sure you click the notification bell below so you don't miss our weekly videos. I'll see you soon.